animal. Nothing will increase because the environment has to combine with the genetics. If there are no genetics, regardless of the environment is good, you we'll never get results. So improving genetic merits of livestock population is important at all levels of management. Sound breeding program is necessary, is a necessary part of the total animal production system. So the breeding program will help you to combine with what the environment is offering to you. So the ideal dairy cow is one that will give you high milk yield, good milk solid, that is the proteins, fat, and the SNF solid, not fat, as well as a well-shaped udder to help you with the health issues, fast milker, especially for the people doing uh, machine milking, good feet and legs, and resistance to diseases. Selection programs for increasing milk production per cow have been very successful over time, especially in Kenya. For the farmers who have been able to select the animals and breed them in the right way, the milk production has been going up. And that sometimes in Kenya, milk production increases with, the, with how the rains are. For the past two years, we have been having very good rain and the feed reserves have been well. So the success of a time. Successful reproduction encompasses the ability to mate. That is coming to heat, to conceive. An animal can be coming on heat but not conceiving because of many other issues, hormonal management, all the others. Ability to nourish and deliver a viable, a, a viable young one at the end of a normal gestation period. That is, I emphasize on a normal gestation period because some farmers, maybe the cow comes on heat is served five times. One time, maybe the bull iriruka. So the farmer says the cow has gone for 10 months. So the selection methods, there's only one way to select, that is to keep the best and cull the poorest. The, there are various selection methods for identifying and estimating the, geno, the genetic and phenotypic values of candidates. So the best, the most commonly used selection methods in dairy farmers are using in Kenya is that one is the performance testing. This is where you use the phenotype. Uh, the phenotypic value of the individual, what you can appraise with your eyes. That's what you use to see and performance recording, all the other things. So you can see the production, you can see the others and all the other things. Since the phenotypic value is determined by both genetic and environmental, the performance is an estimate, not a measure of the genetic value. So whatever you get is a combination of both the environment and the genetic parts. So if the environment is very good and the genetics are very good, you have a very good, you have a very high score on the performance test. But if the genetics are there, but the environment cannot favor the animal, you lose out on the genetic value. So this one is good, is an estimate. It will just give you an estimate, not the actual value. So the advantages are provides information when genetic tests are not available for the candidates. Allows selection to be completed at a young age. This is where you can use the pedigree records. Maybe you know this is a daughter of Mogul. So Mogul has been a world-class bull. So you can use that. But at the end of the day, you have to be very careful. She might be an outlier in the, in the Mogul line, taking some of the recessive genes from the dominant male. So sometimes it might be difficult. It allows to, for selection of bulls, select on the milk records of their female relatives, and also the dams. Like uh, also what we do here, we use the milk records of the dams to select uh, to select possible dams for, for the booze in Kagreg. So this one will allow, the performance testing will allow this. So the disadvantage is that the accuracy is very low, as I said before. Uh, too much emphasis, especially remote, reduces genetic progress. If you emphasize on the relatives, especially the ones who are outliers, you lose out on the genetic progress of your herd. And progeny of favored this is where it came in. Progeny of favored parents are often environmentally favored. That is, you get some parents who are doing very well in a certain environment. They are the ones that you'll favor and you tend to leave the outliers. You'll say, you'll always present what is the best. That is one thing. So this one is the most other common type, progeny testing. We evaluate the breeding value by a study of the expression of the trait in its offsprings. It's a, it's a, it's a two-stage selection determined which animals will produce, the pre, will produce the progenies, followed by culling of those that produce poor progeny. So 
two stage. Select the ones that you produce, then come back later and call what didn't, what didn't produce good progenies. So the main advantage is high accuracy when many progenies are obtained. And this comes about, this is what you call the reliability of the factors. If there are so many progenies tested, the figure that is given is more reliable than comparing a bull. Maybe, for example, a bull has 200 daughters and one has 20 daughters. The reliability of the bull with 200 daughters is more compared to the one with 20. So this one is very nice. Greg used to do this. Nowadays, we are doing genomic testing. And some bulls were, were, became premium bulls. Even the prices of the semen went high, especially the jersey bulls. The disadvantage is only one long generation interval. Before you get to know how a bull is performing in the field, it will take you five, six years. So the long generation, the long generation interval will be there. Then requires high productive rate. In Kenya, where we have a problem with fertility, progeny testing can become a very big problem because I think the average service is uh, 1.8 per cow. So it means that we are serving at least a cow twice for us to get a calf. So if the reproductive rate is very, is very low, you will get the progenies and that will affect the reliability of the figure because you might have used 300 straws, you get 100 uh, offsprings. Out of the 100, you get 70 heifers. So by the time these heifers are up to the maturity age with the managed system, it becomes a problem. So factors to consider when selecting sires is now when the farmer wants to do AI. We're also going to see when a farmer is trying to get the replacement hard. So science selection is a very important decision that a dairy farmer makes because when a farmer decides to go AI, that is a serious farmer who has invested on the art and uh, also wants a faster genetic improvement in the herd. It, increases, it represents a great opportunity to improve the profitability of the daily production enterprises because for this one, the results are instant. The heterosis and or the hybrid vigor comes in very fast. Daily bulls are genetically evaluated for several traits, including production, health, fertility, and type traits. So if you look at, the, at our catalog, you'll be able to see all these things, especially the genomically tested bulls. You see the production, you see the health, that will be the somatic cell scores and the calving is and all the others, the fertility, you see the daughter's conception rate, all the others, and also the type traits, which are usually down there in a graph. Then, then it, the, this information, the genetic information is regularly compiled and published as a summaries or as a catalog. And these ones, the sheet reviews are some key concepts that should be considered in order to make proper selection decisions. That's why you should have a catalog to make the decisions when you have to. So, sorry, there are several factors that you can, uh, you can consider. So what is the production traits, such as milk yield and milk composition, the functional traits? That is longevity. How long is the animal going to stay in the farm? Fertility. The fertility at the end of the day will uh, determine the number of calves the animal is going to give you in the farm. The other health will determine everything from production. It will also affect fertility, the calving ability. Also the calving ability will uh, will also determine the number of animals that the cow will be able to live in the farm. Because if the animal, if the pupil period is shortened, so the pupil period is the time between calving to first heat. If the shorter it is, the more calves you're going to get in the farm. So that is the first thing, that, those are some of the, then these two, the production traits and the functional traits, will have a direct impact on the profitability of the farm. More fertile, the more the replacement heifers. The other health, the less the cost of the veterinary cost. The longevity, the more the animal is able to give the farmer. So cell selection represents opportunity to genetically improve most of the relevant traits. For the Kenyan farmer, 
I think we are still in milk production. Some farmers are now doing trait animals for the shows. But at the end of the day, the traits, the production, and the functional traits have a correlation at the end of the day. So you can consider these. Some of the following points should be considered when selecting the sires. Choose the traits you want to improve on and by how much. What do I mean by this? A farmer should first look at the cow, check the feet, check the udder, and decide on what to improve on. Do I want big animals? So you go for stature. Do I want good udders? You go for the good udder conformation from attachments, height, depth. Do I, how are the feet of my cows? What is the major, what is the what is the thing that I need to, to improve? Then identify the sires from an active bull list that fits your hard goal. I will emphasize on this from an active bull list. Mm, some farmers will get. They go somewhere, maybe see a certain dot of a bull that is long gone. Then you see, so just be having an updated catalog. Because even in our catalog, sometimes we put their semen, bulls with semen in stock from the previous edition. So active bull is so that your breeding goes all up to what is in the market. You don't have to have uh, breeding goals that you cannot achieve. So an active bull list is very important. Decide whether to crossbreed or to which breed you want to restrict yourself to. That is, uh, don't let the inseminator to come and do practicals in your farm, in semen handling. That is, the inseminator just puts the hand in the, in, in the container and gets out whatever is there. Have, make your own decision. If you are crossbreeding, what do you want to crossbreed? What are the impacts? Because at the end of the day, you can't be a farmer who is crossbreeding a Frisian to a Jersey. That is, you are serving a Frisian to a Jersey or serving a Jersey to a Frisian. Two impacts will come. If you breed a Frisian to a Jersey, that is, use the a Frisian bull to a Jersey cow, the stockiers. You breed a, Frisian, a Jersey bull to a Frisian cow, you lose the production. So you need to know what you want. Because if these people just come and put in semen, at the end of the day, your herd is neutralized. And the one thing, if you close, if you cross your animals and they were in pedigree, they all go to foundation, whatever is born. So also check your registration status. So choose three to six bulls, depending on the size of your herd that you want to use in your herd. And make sure to have easy calving for the heifers. Don't just go for the big, big bulls because you have big animals. Also consider the heifers you have because if you get these stock years, they'll affect the puperal period. Prolong the puperal period, prolong the calving interval, bringing losses to the farm. You can match bulls to each cow. That is, you can decide, I'm going to use Edward on cow A. I'm going to use Mark on cow B. I'm going to use Governor on cow C and get the semen. This one will go with the attributes of the cow that you would like to improve. Maybe you want a big stature. Mark is the bull for you. Maybe you want high production. You want Governor and Edward. Maybe you want very good legs. You go for Kigera. But at the end of the day, if you go for Kigera, check the calving is. So at any one time, check your animal and decide what you want. Then after you have done all these considerations, it's now time to breed your animals or mate your animals. Now you can get the semen, synchronize or use natural heat after going through all those points. So something that you need about the sires, pedigree information. All bulls around the world are either half brothers or outcrows of, their, of some of the sires. At the moment, we have super sire. We have the mogul. Those are two very dominant bulls that are all over the world. Everyone has been using them. And also the bulls that we have are outcrosses or relations, have relations with that sire. So you might be using mogul, but then you won't go and use another bull. You get there related. So to avoid inbreeding is what you need to know. Be able to read your catalog. Know if I'm using a certain bull called Mark, and I want to bring in imported semen. You might get the semen that you bring is the grand sire to Mark. What happens? That's a, you bring you start bringing in in, in breed and this one reduces the profitability in the farm because you get a lot of stunting, reduced meat production. 
That is, you had gotten very good hybrid vigor and it's all reduced immediately. So the pedigree information of the sires is very important. You just don't read about the bull. Go to the sire and then go to the dam and then go to the grand sire. Sometimes you get even in Greek, we have half brothers. So you have to be very careful of what, how you are doing it. So there's this other index that is usually on the catalog, the total performance index. This one is the one that combines type, management, and production traits. And it's the one that is used to rank bulls. So you'll get a bull saying TPI 2500, TPI 2700, TPI this and this. It's just a combination of all these factors. That is the type, management, and the production. They all have a percentage. When someone else will be doing sire catalog interpretation, we explain this further. It is six to identify the cows who excel in the degree production, health, and conformation. So it has to be a good producer, high health traits, and also the conformation at the end of the day. So TPI selects elite animals who represent the best combination of the desired traits. And that's why you hear some bulls like the moguls and the super sires are very famous up to now because of what they, they offer in there because they have been ranked on the TPIs. So predicted transmitting ability is also something that you'll see in the, in the production traits of, uh, of the bull. So when you are selecting, you need to consider this. It's the average genetic value of a given trait that an animal transmits to the offspring. So this is what you expect the offspring to get above what the dam is producing. So if you see a bull has plus 400 and something milk kgs, that's what you expect, you expect in a lactation to increase on what the dam was producing. With the management factors held constant that they are good. You get PTA fat and PTA protein. Sometimes it's in kgs, sometimes it's in percentage. So you need to consider this. So Kenyan farmers are currently on milk to increase milk production, that is in kgs. So get a bull that will give you milk. But at the end of the day, if you get the milk, the more the milk, the, sometimes you go and lose on the components, that is the fat and the proteins. So at the end of the day, you cannot have everything. You have to choose one. So the reliability of these percentages depends on the genetic merit of the parent, that is one. How, are the, how, how is the pedigree of the parent? Has it been good or it's, the, it's in foundation stage or something? Performance records and the progeny testing. So it encompasses all these. How many daughters have been tested for these so that you can get the PTA milk? That is the reliability. How many daughters have been, how are the performance records? And these are very big problem in Kenya because farmers are just registering animals without performance recording. So you can get an animal is in pedigree, but is producing lower than an animal that is intermediate or foundation. But because the farmer has been using AI, believes that anytime you use AI, the animal qualifies for the next stage. No, the animal only qualifies upon performance records. So be very careful when you are buying animals and you get maybe registered pedigree. Can you ask for the performance? You may get you are buying a pedigree animal, but your animals in intermediate or foundation are doing better than the animal. So a somatic cell score is basically used to determine the mastitis resistance in the animal. Should be between three and 3.5. 3.5 on the higher end, but the lower the, the figures, the better. And because mastitis is, has a very big impact, I know my vet friends are, at the moment, even you are in Ishika, this one, uh, it's a good in Kamana for the vets and uh, people doing uh, treatments out there. But for the farmer, what is the cost of the farmer? Reduced milk production, that is one. Treatment cost, mastitis is very expensive to treat. Dead and premature culling, because if an animal gets mastitis, either dies or loses quarters. When an animal loses three quarters, the farmer will just recommend for slaughter. Decrease in genetic advancement. Anytime you lose an animal in the farm, you lose one stage of uh, advancement. If, if you have lost a heifer that had come from uh, intermediate, it went to appendix, and it dies, definitely you go back to the dam, who is that? intermediate so that you can get another dam to improve. And maybe the next time you serve use conventional semen, you get a bull. So you are still, the genetic advancement in that line of that dam becomes a problem. Also something that happens, dam penalized on daughter selection. What I mean by this, 
if you go to select uh, cows, eh, then you see you get the daughter is producing very good daughters, but she has lost two quarters. You'll be very careful. So the daughters are penalized because of the dam, or the dam is penalized when you want to buy her, or when you want maybe for some of us who recruit dams outside there, you get she has lost a quarter. We, we won't pick her, but because maybe it was something management. Management is the key on mastitis control. So if a dam loses quarters, two quarters or so, I wouldn't go for the daughters because I, I didn't know. Is it management? Is it genetic? And sometimes you get most of the mastitis might be managmental problem. So the daughters, even during shows, becomes a problem. Even when you want to buy the daughters and one has lost a quarter, you just you can't pick the animal. The calving is, so this is the percentage of the bulls calf born that are considered difficult in the first lactation of the animals. Easy, 6%, 7%. These are factors that you need to consider because as we said, the shorter the pupil period, the shorter the calving interval and the more calves you get and the more you get from the animal. So if we say you should have a calf every year, but your animal always has, you are always using bulls that uh, have difficult calving is, becomes very, it becomes uh, very difficult. Because if a farmer goes to an endocrine Mwenzake, he's a very big calf. They'll just ask what was the name of that bull and they'll serve even very small heifers. And maybe the, the bull that, uh, the cow that gave birth to that uh, calf is in her third or fourth lactation. The, the ram queens and the ram diameters are doing very, very well. They, they, they are not as uh, for the heifers. So, but most of the time you get the bull calves, they are bigger even by weight and they are being born compared to the heifers. But at the end of the day, management comes up. If your heifer wasn't brought well, even if it had the stature, genetically the stature was big, but with the poor management, especially during the winning period, the calf stands. Definitely the cow becomes a, a problem at calving because it will be of, of small stature. The ramp angles won't have grown well, including the other won't have grown well. So the heifer management also plays a key part in the calving ease of the animals because I'm very sure most of the bulls have a big stature. And even those that have small stitches, they are not the small stitches that will cause dystopias. So the other thing you need to check these are very important. And this is when I say the farmer needs to look at the animal and then select the sires for feet and neck conformation. These are the linear traits. They give one figure, that is the rear leg side view. It's a, this is, a, the, is it very straight? Is it too curved, too straight posting? Too curved circled? The rear leg, rear view, hawks in or hawks out? The feet angle, lower strip. So the cows with hawks in and toes out, that is, uh, they almost have the knock knee. Let me use that. It increases the strength because the animals won't trend well and also increases trauma on the rear udder as the animal is walking, especially if you get the animal as a very big udder. So you need to be in that between posting and secord at around uh, 45 degrees. So also with the posty legs, the animals get tired very fast. They can't flex the hind limbs. And most of these animals you get, they are very big adders, they can't stand for long. So even feeding is a problem. So you don't get the maximum out of the animals. And when you are selecting a sire for your dairy herd, these are one of the key considerations that you should have. What do you want to improve in your animals? If you have a problem with the feet, focus on the feet, improve on the feet first, then start in working on the production. Because if you start with the production, the animals won't be, have longevity in the farm. So longevity determines the productivity of any dairy enterprise. So this is the ideal. On my left, that is the rear leg side view, and that is the foot angle. As I said, around 45 degrees. The animal treads well. It's not on its sole, nor is it on its heel. So the animals is trending very well. So this is the rear view. The legs should be you should, they should not be touching each other. You see the two animals, these are an intermediate on my left and this one is an extreme on the, on the, but the animals should have enough space to accommodate the other. Even when the animals have hawks in, you get, they are very poor adders, very small ones. So the other composite this is a very important thing. And it's a very important physical trait of the adder. So the adder depth, how far does the adder go? 
towards the ground relative to the hawks. Is it below the hawks, above the hawks, or extremely above the hawks? High adders related with less mastitis, less teeth injury, and greater longevity. Because if the adders, uh, if the adder goes below the hawks, you get some cows will be, will, they will have a lot of trauma on the teeth. So the lower the mastitis, the less the injury, the greater the longevity. The animal is still longer in the farm. Adder cleft. This is an indicator of how strong the median ligaments, and this will make this, this is an indicator if the other will become flabby. So if the two quarters are well attached, you see the suspension of the ligament is tight enough. You know the animals have a longer life because uh, the other depth increases as you, it goes below the hocks as you prolong the lactations. So if the first lactation and the other is almost getting to the hocks, you are very sure by the time you get to the third lactation, the other will be so much far below the hocks and you'll get a lot of cases of mastitis. The other height, that is the distance between the milk secreting tissue and the vulva. How far is it? The higher, the better. So the teeth placement, some of these things, uh, the farmer might not consider, but they have a great importance in, uh, in milking, hand milking or machine milking. So front teeth that are placed outside of the quarters cause liner slippage, that is the one in the, for the machine and squatting during milking. So when the milkman is working, is milking the animals, the, the, more than the one that goes into the buckets. Then rear teeth can be placed too close to each other and this will affect machine milking. So for these people who are doing machine milking, the teeth placement is very important. And the distance, the distance between the teeth will increase because as the, as the other also grows bigger, so the distances will increase. So the long, if, if that, the heifer they are so far apart, you expect the other will become flabby in, uh, at the end of the day. So for other attachment, is the evaluation of the strength of the other attachment on the body wall. Sometimes farmers might pelonize animals because the other has a small bulge. But this one you expect it in the, pro, in the high producing animal. So before you judge the animal, can you ask the farmer, how much milk is the animal producing? How many times are you milking the animal? And the other conformation determines the other health. You might have a very good somatic cell score, but once you get poor other attachments, the teeth are always on the ground, you expect to get a lot of cases of mastitis. Poor teeth placements, who are milking abilities, so you get a lot of cases with mastitis. So this is the four other attachment. It should be at least flush to the body, to the abdominal wall. But you see with the high producing animals, as I said, you can get a small bulge. So don't penalize the animals on the, without knowing the production of the animals at the end of the day. That's the other height, you can see the secreting tissues are high up, very few, very few centimeters away from the, from the vulva. So this is the under width, wide, not a stress to the animals. Other cleft should be big. If you check here with the one that the full other, the second one is not a full other. If you can check the teeth, how they are placed, they are very close together. But this one is better because when the other feels the teeth goes, they go back to be in the central position. They are fixed well. Then we have the other depth. You see that one is above the hocks. So the ramp, uh, distance between the, the width, the distance between the posterior points of the pin bones. This one is very important. The width and the angle. Because these were the ligaments of the other is attached. So the bigger the width, the good, the, the better the angle, the more the attachment, the bigger the other you are going to get. So the ramp angle, the angle between the keeps to the pins from the side of the cow, this one we determine basically the calving is. And at the end of the day, fertility. Because uh, there's something called lochia that the animal discharges after it gives birth, the kilala, you get maybe some brownish fluid, red fluid discharging from the animal. The faster the lochia is, comes out, the faster the return to pupil period. So the cases of metritis, they never come up. So the better the ramp will, the less the dystocia. And most of the farmers, if they get a dystocia and the calf dies, the animal is just sent to the butcher. 
A farmer cannot stay there trying to call you to do a phytotomy, which will be very expensive to the farmer. So these are an ideal cow, as I said. The ramp weeds, wide, and the ramp angle sloping well. This one is a third calver somewhere in Meru. Doing very well. No, she was on her fourth uh, pregnancy when, when we took the photos. But you can see the other is still above the hawks at, fourth, at the fourth uh, uh, lactation. It's above the, it's above the, the hawks. This is a good animal. It shows you longevity, but this animal can give you two, three more cows before the other becomes problematic. The ramp angle. For some heifers, you cannot penalize because the ramp angle later on straight, it is straight, it can straighten itself up later on with progressive uh, calving. So you have to know how many calvings the cow has had. Heifers, if it's not too bad, if it's too hard, you know there are three classes. Satisfactory, that one are the heifers that have, uh, have gone through, the ramp angles are, go are good, then there's the deferred group. So if the if the heifers are the deferred group, most of the time, if you give it by the second lactation, that means a satisfactory group. And then finally, when you are classifying, when you have the unsatisfactory group, those are the ones that you either call or you sell with a disclaimer, which we rarely do. Selection of, uh, of the replacement heifers. So this is what you need, the replacement herd. How do you want to select it? Replacement heifers, these ones, they are the genetic building blocks of the future generations. Therefore, a farmer or a breeder should be very careful. Should carefully consider which females they breed and all and buy and from who. So at the end of the day, very few no farmer will ever sell their best animals. So being a breeder or when you're buying replacement stock from other farmers, you have to be able to get the best among the worst. Because whatever the farmer is offsetting is not the very best, it's not the cream. It's not the cream of the hand. So you have to get the, the best out of the worst. So factors to consider is one, age at first calving or service. So this one is very important. It's an indicator of fertility. There are very many things going around. There are farmers who prefer to serve their calf, their heifers early. That is by 12, 15 months so that they can calf in by 24 months. Some farmers would prefer to keep their heifers until they're around 18 to 20 months so that they can serve. Every farmer, have their, every farmer has their own ideologies. Some farmers say that if you serve them too early, they leave the farm earlier. That is, you affect the longevity. Others say when you serve them at around 18 to 20 months, they stay longer in the farm. So the breeding objective, as I said, is for the farmer. What do you want in your animals? Short calving interval, short, uh, young age at first service, all. Do you want the animals to, to stay longer in the farm? So this one is, you leave it to the farmer. All farmers have their own ideologies and some uh, have been uh, proven. The cows have between 18 to 20 months stay longer. They have a longer longevity because they'll have matured better. And you also get some very good productions from them because uh, they'll have, develop the other better. The growth rate, this one is for the homegrown calves, in, in farm calves. You get the farmer getting the cows that are coming on heat earlier and also the ones that are growing very fast. They get to the puberty weight very fast. The farmer will never sell them. So you need to know how are of these calves, how is the dairy gain? How is the dairy weight gain? At what weight at first service? Then you compare it to the tech contemporaries. That is the contemporaries are those who are born at the same time because most of the farmers are breeding season. Pedigree information, you need to know how was the sire, how was the dam, how is the registration status? Because with the pedigree information is the only time, that, those are the only facts that you can produce for you to have your animals registered in a certain class apart from foundation. Because if you, have, if you don't provide the pedigree information, that animal is considered to be in the foundation class. And uh, maybe the farmer was a very good breeder, even the animal might be having in pedigree class. So dam's performance and also the registration status. If the dam wasn't registered, and, if, and you know even the sire, the daughter will not be registered before the dam. So if the dam 
wasn't registered and was served with the pedigree of pure breed uh, semen. The daughter won't be, won't be registered as a, an intermediate because you don't have the registration number of the dam. So you need to know was the dam performance and registration, you need to know the dam's performance and registration status. And you have to be very careful when you are buying, especially the cows, maybe second or that covers. The farmer will always hype. At the same idea in Atwanga Maziwa Mingi. But you may get they are selling them because of trouble of problems. So I would advise farmers and in, uh, would be breeders get someone who can certify your animals before you buy. Get the production records, do an impromptu visit before the farmer milks. Of course, some farmers won't milk for a day. So he lets Kumnaenda, the cow produces 20 liters, but initially this cow does 15 liters or 15 liters, but you get doing 25. Chifika Nyumbani, it produces 12. So the physical or the phenotypic, uh, you also need to check the phenotype of the animal. That is the stature. How is it? Is it a big animal, small animal? What might have led, uh, might have led to this animal being small? Is it uh, management? Check the contemporaries in the farm. The farmer is selling three or more cows, or maybe they are the farmers that do mass, they sell in car heifers in, in, in mass. The under confirmation, most of the heifers are sold when the other has already started uh, getting milk. That is uh, six, seven months, eight. Check the confirmation. How far is it in relation to the hawks? The leg set. These are things you'll see even with a very young heifer that is even, uh, that has just been born. You can be able to see how is the leg set. You can be see the, depth, the back line. You can see the depth. That is the, uh, how is the chest region? The bigger the depth, the more you expect from the animal. The dam health records. This will give you the somatic cell scores, the retained placentas. In fact, most of the catalogs coming from the US, they have this, this trait of the retained placenta. And because it has a direct impact on the longevity of the animal and uh, the productivity, profitability, it will be there. The calving is. If you go and check, maybe the records of the animal, the belt records, the cow has had, any time it calves down, there's pyometra. So you can co correlate that with determining the ramp, the ramp and the back line, the ramp angle and the ramp width. You can be able to see, is it due to calving ease or is it due to higher chances of this animal getting a retained placenta? The hard averages. If you're going to buy cows in their first or second lactation, how do you know? You need to know the hard average because you don't want to know to get animals producing below the hard average. If possible, get an animal that is doing at least 10 to 15% above the hard average. Because if you get those ones doing below, it means they are the outliers. The farmer is carrying based on production. So, and I told you the farmer will never sell the best animals. And I said, get the best out of the worst provided. So you have to be there. Then there's this thing, the hard, most superior conformation traits. You can go to a farm, a farm will never have, will never have 100% in the conformation traits. You can go to the farm and get to see the farmer, the cows are very good adders, but very poor exit. So if you are buying animals from that farm, you need to come and improve on the exit. So you are aware, you just check the most superior conformation traits in the farm. Check all the check the animals that the farmer has. Check the udders, check the ramp, check the feet, and then you can see these animals have a strong point on on uh, on the other conformation. Then you then you can say these animals are doing very well on the leg sets. These animals are doing very well on the ramps. These animals are doing very well on the dairy form. That is the, the stature and the depth. So every herd has its own superior conformation traits. There'll never be that you'll get animals have all the traits at a go. If you miss out on the feet, you get they have very good others. If you miss out on the others, you might get they have very good. And that's what is called breeding. Breeding is just meant to improve on what is not working. So like this one, the picture that you can see here, this is a Nasha cow from uh, ADC Katuke. You can see the back line is very nice, very wide. Ramp width, the ramp angles are also very nice from the other side. It's, it's dry, this animal is dry. 
and it was in the fifth lactation. You see where the other is. Even if it fills up, it will never go so far below the hawks. The back line is very straight. It's a well-balanced cow, let me put it that way. The depth, the angularity, you can see it's towards the head. Sometimes it's not blocky. So get a balanced frame because if you get a problem with the back line, it will affect the other height at the end of the day. So this is also a very other fifth calver. You can see where the other is. It was a few days to calving. It's in Eldoret. You can check the under four other attachment. It's very nice. The other depth, very nice. The back line, very nice. The ramp angles, they are very nice. It's only how the, the pictures are not very clear. You can also see that the, the tile attachments, they are also very nice. So these animals, you never have problems with them later on. This is what I mean by hard, more superior conformation. You can see like these animals, they are all grazing somewhere in Akuru, but you can see the other attachments are very nice. The other traits, you can see the cleft is very prominent. The, the guard rays of the distance, how far it is. The other height, also very nice. The other depth, it's also very good. But you could, you could check some of these animals, they have the hawks in or very posty legs. So you have to compromise and uh, that's, you can breed it out. I'll give you an example of this one, bias between production and conformation. This is a Jesse cow. The loins, that is, if you check the back line, it dips. That is the loin part. It's very weak. But the jersey animal is doing around uh, 32 liters. So correct the back line through breeding. You have the production. You only need one generation. The next calving will improve on the back line. So you can use this one as the foundation to improve on the progeny. So in breeding, you have to have a bias. What do you want first? Conformation or you want the production. You correct conformation faster than production. So do the conformation, then start with the production later on. So to conclude, so the daily breeding is a continuous process that takes time to effect change. This is not something that you'll get a cow today and get results next year. The generation interval in cattle breeding is very high. Next time there'll be maybe a presentation on the dairy goats. I didn't call I didn't, sorry, I didn't add it up here. So you have to be very patient. Patience and genetics is the only way you are going to make it. Either way, if you are not patient enough, it becomes very expensive because you'd now be forced to do the embryo transfers, which meant it which is a bit expensive. So you have to be very you have to be very patient. Sometimes even the embryo transfers, you might get some traits that you need to breed out among the ones that you have gotten. Yes, you have done embryo transfers, you have got uh, pedigree animals, but at the end of the day, you get the conformation traits are not doing well. So you have also to breed out those bad traits. You breed out as much as, much as possible the undesirable traits and retain as many as possible the desirable. So when you are selecting the bull, make sure that it's not affecting, it's not reducing, it is not de de degrading the herd, it's more of improving the herd. Farmers and breeders should consider management before selection of these sires and replacement herds. And this one I emphasize on one thing. You might decide to go and buy cows from one of these big farms in Kenya, Morongaro's farm, anywhere, to Jenga farms. Those farms that are doing 40, 50 liters. But at the end of the day, what you have in your farm, you can only give a cow the feed reserves that you have, you can only sustain a cow doing 10 liters. So the genetic potential of this animal is not achieved. And it becomes very frustrating to the farmer because the costs, you bought the animals at 250,000 shillings. The animal comes and starts giving you 10 liters, but the farmer told you that the dams were doing 52, or maybe their first or second covers, they were doing 40, 50. But due to the management problem, especially the feeding, the animals never gain their full genetic potential. And then have realistic breeding objectives. Know what you want. By realistic, I mean, can you put targets that you can achieve at the end of the day? Breeding targets. Don't target maybe on a, a breed that even semen has never been imported in Kenya. And maybe you call our salespeople here, you ask maybe, can I get uh, Santa get through the semen? You see? Can I get maybe some other thing? Have realistic breeding objectives. Know what you want at any one time and what is your capacity. Consider management. 
Then get your realistic breeding objectives. Then use your previous experiences to make decisions. If you bought a cow from a certain farm and it has, been, it has chronic mastitis, why should you go back to that farm? You move to the next one. If an animal, you brought in animals and you discovered that maybe I was using mats and I was getting a lot of cases of mastitis, then I started using maybe rice husks, the mastitis reduce, cases reduced. Use that experience to help you improve on what you have in the farm. Because if you make a mistake with genetics, it's a lifetime mistake. If you breed animals to the wrong bulls, you only have option. You only have one option to, to regulate the, the spread of the genetic uh, mismatch that you had by culling the animal. So you cull a whole generation. So you increase the, the generation interval in your farm. Then there's something else that is affecting farmers at the moment. The veterinarians in the field, they know they're having a problem with this. Reliance on the internet. So be a dependent farmer. Don't cause problems to the service providers. Be very reliable. Work with the uh, work with the farmer so that you can know. Don't don't try too much. You get an animal sick and you Google. Then you tell the farmers, no, my my cow has a shipping fever, and the animal has been living in the farm all through. It has never even boarded a pickup. I just talk about So and also the. Reliance on the internet has become a problem because the farmers get a lot of unrealistic goals. The farmer goes to the internet and says, maybe sees a gear bull. He has it's doing 45. You come, you start looking for the gear animals, you look for them, you get them at a very expensive price. Then they don't give you that because of the management problem. Your breeding goal objectives were not realistic. So have avoid the Get what you want from the internet. Let not the internet gives you what it wants because that will also bring conflict with service providers, conflict with your people who you have in the farm because you expected a cow to do 80, comes here, does 20 or 30, which is the average production anyway. But you did you get the environment where these animals was, was getting, was doing 80. In your internet search, did you know what the animal was being fed? Maybe the animal was being fed soya and uh, very high quality concentrate feed. The quality of a concentrate feed is not as good as much as possible, aflatoxin, all the other things. So be a realistic breeder. So being in Kagrek, those are the four breeds we have. You have the Frisia, Asha, Jazzy, Gansi. This one is what you can get from Kagrek for the dairies. But at the moment, you have one composite breed called the Magic 50. So you can also try out that. But for these ones, you can get cement anytime, anywhere in our substations for the four dairy breeds. As we have just said there, we have just talked about the presentation. So I'd like to thank you for reasoning and uh, maybe there are any questions I can answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tari. That was a very good presentation. Thank you, we've learned a lot. I think uh, by the end of this session, some of us are becoming vets. Eh? We are getting to understand a few things here and there, especially on uh, breeding and choice of breeds, the phenotypics and the genotypics. Thank you very much. That was uh, very elaborate. And therefore, at this juncture, I want to take in a few questions. There was one question from Hilda. Hilda, thank you for the question. The question was, does AI apply to farmers rearing animals for beef? And if so, what factors are considered? Does AI apply to farmers rearing animals on beef? And if so, what factors are considered? So uh, I, I, I just said something small to Hilda that uh, yes, AI is done on beef animals. And uh, we look at breeds like Boran, Sahiwar, Caroly, Cemental, and Hayford. Those, breed, uh, those cements are also available at Kagrik. Uh, maybe, Dr. you can elaborate further. Karibu sana, Dr. OK, just to add on what uh, Mary has said. Eh? Uh, Kagrik has taken up the in initiative to provide uh, the beef uh, cement to the farmers, but the uptake has not been much. Most of the farmers are doing the sidewalls and the uh, and the, the Saiwa is the one that is the most prevalent, and the Boran, then Charlie and Cemento. 
but it's also a very good initiative because of the cost of the bulls. To get a Saiwa bulls with less than 150,000 shillings, you can get a registered pure Saiwa bull. So, but the seamen, you can be able to, to you can be able to, to improve your heart. And the other thing is, with the more bulls you can get through AI, in Kagrik, we have a selection of around uh, four bulls and three more are income, two more are incoming. You can have a selection of six bulls, but with a natural mating, you only have a selection of one bull that you can afford. And what happens? Because you don't want to, leave, to release your bull very early, you get a lot of inbreeding. So with AI, you will have a diversity, a range of bulls that you can use, six, so you can be able to have it any one time. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Daktari. I think uh, Hilda, you well answered. You can still contact us for further information, for more information, and uh, we really appreciate. Uh, we had a second question from Lillian. I'm trying to get the question and I can't see it. Lillian, can you kindly unmute and ask your question, please? Uh, so this is a question posted on our Facebook live stream. Um, on average, what is the productive life of Kagrik bulls? I think Dr. Mwangi, you can answer that for us. Sorry, sorry pardon? The sorry. question is, yeah. on average, what is the productive life of Kagrik bulls? The productive life? Yes. Okay, uh, just to answer on that. Uh, the productive life most of the time goes with the management process in the farm. But uh, we have had some bulls, the ones that we have gone through. The problem with Kenya is that uh, progeny testing takes too long before farmers come. And most of the farmers, when they know something, they don't want the other farmers to know. So there's a bull called Johnny. I think he had uh, eight lactations. There was a Nasha that did uh, 12 lactations. We also happened to have a bull here called SDR Express. The mother had lactations, I think there were 14 lactations. And that has been shown in his daughters who are, who are trying to follow up at the moment. You get daughters in their fourth, fifth lactations, but they look more of second calvus. So it's a range, but at the end of the day, the longevity will be affected by how well you manage your animals. But at the end of the day, because we have the adaptability part for our bulls that our environment, we have the G and the E. We have combined the G and the E, the genetics and the, the genotype and the environment to get the bulls that we have at, at Kagrik. You expect them to have a longer productive life compared to the imported semen. And that is what the longevity will also in, influence the, the productivity and the profitability. So we are doing well with the productive life. With good management for Frisians, I can assure you six to eight lactations with good management. Ashas, they'll do even more. Yeah. Back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Tari. We really appreciate. Um, I will just go through a few comments on the chat. Uh, we have Mary Mugwe, who says, great presentation so far, Dr. Mwangi. Uh, we have, um, somebody was saying you are too fast, but I understand you slowed down. And uh, we had a question from Hilda. And uh, we have a thank you from Hilda again. We have uh, Kirani. Kirani says, excellent presentation. Uh, William Kiplagat, thank you for your comment. He's saying, awesome presentation, Dr. Mwangi. Uh, we have Veronica Chuchu. He's saying, she's saying, very informative. Thanks for the excellent presentation. And uh, Samuel Chege finally managed to get in. Thank you so much, Samuel Chege. And he says, very good topic, Dr. Mwangi. And uh, William Kiplagat uh, says, kindly give us more information on the composite breed. It could be good for us who come from semi-arid areas. I think I will give you a, a minute, Dr. Tari, you highlight uh, just briefly on the composite breed uh, for William. William wants to know more of composite breeds. Although I'll still give you uh, our contacts, you can contact us and uh, see how you get uh, further and more information. Before you answer, William, Dr. Tari, mm -hmm. and we have Elia Mwangi also says, thank you very much. Uh, on finishing, you talked about Majestic 50. Please elaborate Kidogo. 
I didn't get it. So Eliam, we will be getting back to you. We will also get to you personally, and maybe even we share our catalog. It's also on our website where you can get much more information on these breeds. Again, uh, Nancy Mulo says insightful information, Doc. Well done. Philip Tare says, uh, please, share, please share the presentation for further reference. Yeah. Kindly for those who want to have further reference on this presentation, we, we are streaming it live on our Facebook. So you can turn in our Facebook page, you like it, you subscribe to it, and uh, you will get uh, the presentation. You can replay it, especially for those who felt it was a bit fast, you can replay the presentation from our Facebook uh, page. Lillian Chebet says, from my foundation cow, when do I say that I now have a pedigree? Doctor, I think you'll also have to answer that. Those are two questions now. That was a question posted uh, from our Facebook uh, live stream. So, uh, Dr. I think uh, you have uh, two issues to highlight. You can highlight more about uh, um, the, the bulls you've been requested here. We've, we've had give us information on composite breed and give us information about Majestic 50. And then uh, the question from uh, uh, Facebook Live that says, uh, from my foundation cow, when do I say now I have a pedigree? Karibu sana, Daktari, just as we wind up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, for the, it's, I would like to correct the person, it's Magic 50. Magic 50 is a composite breed that has been developed in the coast regions because of the trypanotolerance. And um, we are trying more to take care of the farmers towards the lake basin area where the trips are a problem. And these animals are doing very well because uh, it's a composite breed having several. It's, uh, it's, it has been stabilized and it at least has 50% uh, of both indicas. The both indicas being maybe a, co a combination between the gear and the saiwo. Then it has, it has outcrosses of the ashes and the, especially ashes and Frisian maybe. So it has been developed in a farm called Makitosha in uh, Malindi. And uh, with the performance recording that has been going on and the registrations, you get heifers that are doing, uh, cows, no, sorry, cows that are doing above 30, 30 kgs of milk on uh, basic management, nothing complicated. So, and these are animals that are with 50% both indicas. The adaptability will be very high, especially for the people who do free range grazing. They are also very good, they also do purpose. We had one that uh, was uh, 1.5 ton at two years. They are growing faster than the Borans. So even for the people doing feedlot, they're also very good animals. You get the milk and by chance you get some bulls, you can also do feedlot to them. And because it's an upcoming breed, Kajiado has taken up very easy, has been taking up uh, the semen we had. We recently recruited three bulls. We are still training them for semen production. Uh, the bulls came in around December, quarantine, all the other things. So we uh, we want to start maybe semen production from in the course of next week. So maybe in the next maybe two or three weeks, you can inquire for semen. But those who have tried Magic 50, there were the bulls, the Sansao, Mal Malgudo, maybe some people have had, especially from Kajiado areas. They are doing very well. No farmer has become disappointed out of it. And now the best thing is that uh, we have more, bull, more bulls available. So that means that the gene pool now is open. It's not like you have only one bull. You have a selection of, at the moment, three bulls, and maybe more will be coming up, will be coming in towards May. May, June, we might be having more bulls. So at the end of the day, we intend to have at least five bulls at any one time so that to diversify on the gene pool. We don't have a lot of inbreeding. So that's all on the Magic 15. So, the Magic 50 is also the composite, so I think I've tackled two questions that ago. Then the other one is the foundation to pedigree. Foundation to pedigree goes, uh, you have to use, register your animal first to be foundation. That is the first thing that you need to do. Once you register your animal as foundation, start using, now you use uh, registered sires who are pedigree. Then you go to intermediate, then uh, leave intermediate, you go to appendix. Then you go after appendix, you go to uh, pure. 
then pedigree. So at the end of the day, you have to record, you have to register each offspring that comes up. And before, at the moment, the law is, you cannot go to pedigree, not unless you are doing also, you're also doing milk recording. Because we need to know if this animal of yours is in pedigree, how much is it producing? Is it producing better than the foundation? What is the percentage genetic gain that the animal has acquired? What is the BV? the breeding value estimate of the animal. If you get the estimates for the breeding value, EBVs, I think you see them in the, in the catalog. We need to know, has these animals, how was the hybrid vigor? How was the heterosis in these animals? Because at the end of the day, it's not just about recording. You need to record and at the end of the day, combine the genetics with the environment to get the phenotype. And with the phenotype, we'd be able to see the performance recording. So it's not just about serving, 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 serving. We want also to know we are pushing up really Kenya Starbook to do milk recording so that we, we can have elite animals at the end of the day. Not elite on paper, elite is even on the field because as I told you, you can go to buy a cow, maybe registered pedigree, but the production is not as, as expected. To put a ngombe maybe co intermediate appendix, but doing very well compared to what you are calling pedigree. And make sure you register all the dams. If you don't register the dam, if the dam dies by bad luck, and you had not registered her, whatever is born, whatever is an offspring of that dam becomes foundation. So make sure you, re you register at every stage. Sawa, sawa. I hand over to you, Mary. Thank you very much, Dr. I think that question has been well answered. Also the sentimental and also about uh, Magic 50. I think it's a magic cow even by the name. Now, um. Nathan Kiprutich says, good presentation, Dr. Tari. And Halima Nenkari says, good presentation. Kindly let us know how you work with Livestock Recording Center. Uh, over to you, Dr. Tari, we finish with that one. Please. Okay, how we work with the Recording Center is there are the people who register our bulls. We also work with them hand in hand to register the dams and make sure we also get performance recording for the farms that uh, they visit and see they are doing very well. There are also the people who sometimes go back, work with the register, uh, with the, they work hand in hand with the Kenya Standbook so that we can get, they are the people who determine the breeding values. They are the people who do the calculations of the breeding values, EBVs. And those, this is what we use basically for our bulls. They are also the people who at the end of the day should track the daughters of the bulls that we have. They are the people who should do the progeny testing. So we work hand in hand in them. They give us the information. They also recommend farmers for us to go and see and see how our, daughter, our daughters of the Greek bulls are, are doing. So, so that is what is happening. Uh, I can also go with the next questions that uh, I, I think they are almost they are from the Facebook live streamer. Huh? Yeah. who's currently doing registration for the Kenya Standbook. Kenya Standbook are the people who do the registration. So just contact them. I think you can, uh, through our office, you can get the contacts of the Kenya Standbook. You get someone there called Mr. Leonard Muhebi. They are the people who register. They'll send their staff to, the, to your farm, assess your animals and register. So that is the easiest. Kenya Standbook is, is current, is the one that is doing that. KSB, based in uh, Nakuru Showground. They have the offices there. So with any time you can get contacts with KSB and then they'll, they'll give you. They work hand in hand with the Kenya Livestock Breeding Association, KLBA. So KLBA happens to be an organization incorporating the breed societies and everyone. Okay, thank you. Mary? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tari. I think uh, all our questions are now answered. Uh, Francis Kimboy says, thank you so much for training. Could you please train us on feed formulation in future because it goes hand in hand with good genetic makeup and high productivity. Kimboy, we will be looking at that. Uh, we have uh, livestock production officers on board and uh, they'll be working hand in hand with uh, the vets here. We will come up with a lesson on feed formulation one of these fine days. So just keep, uh, keep locked in. Now, uh, the other thing is uh, I want to appreciate everyone who's been here. Uh, this webinar is made possible through the combination of um, 
CAGRIC, Kenya Animal Genetic Resource Center, and KLB, Kenya Livestock, KBA. And uh, I don't know if there's somebody from KBL, KLBA, right. kindly, sorry, sorry. It is KLBA, Kenya Livestock Breeding Association. So anybody from there, maybe you can put up your hand and say something, John Kibe and the rest, kindly. We had one, but I think he's getting network challenges. So uh, I still appreciate them and appreciating absentia. I appreciate everybody in Kagrik who's made uh, this uh, webinar possible. Most special thanks to Dr. Ari Mwangi. I know he's been very resourceful. If you have questions, you just forward them to us. Uh, our, our Dr. Ari will also assist you. And therefore, as we wind up, uh, what we are saying is that it is possible and AI is the way to go. And kindly let's preach this gospel. Dr. Tari said the biggest problem we have in Kenya is that when you find something good, you don't want another person to know. But that is the narrative we are out to change because we want everybody to get the best. If you get 20 liters and another person gets 30 liters and the other person gets 50 liters of milk, then we will stop importing milk from Uganda and we will be self-sufficient. Actually, we should be exporting. So uh, in that matter, I want us uh, to go out there, uh, preach this gospel, and uh, let's come in. Let's improve our genetics. We may not be in a position because of our, uh, the land tenure, the land issues, the way our lands are getting smaller and smaller by day. Actually, I think uh, those in Mount Kenya region, Nairobi region, Nowadays, our biggest competitor in land space is real estate coming up. But by the end of the day, we shall never feed on our big buildings. We still need our milk. We still need our beef out there. And therefore, uh, what I may urge all of us is that we may not be in a position to increase our herd, but we are in a position to improve our breeds for better production. And that is what all Kagrit is all about. And we are working hand in hand with all of you to make sure we improve our genetics and we improve our very local breeds to the very best. Otherwise, I don't have much to say. Uh, anyone with anything to say, you can raise up your hand. I think with that much. Um, with that much, uh, let me just appreciate all of you. And uh, we can wind up with a word of, oh, there's a question. I'm told there's a question coming up. So, um, hmm. Levi Wambulwa says, good work. Um, Morangode says, uh, Maura Mangode says, great, Dr. Mwangi. Mary Madenge, you have a question here. It says, how possible is it to train inseminators for cattle registration? How possible is it to train inseminators for cattle registration? Madenge, what I can say, it is very possible. Actually, we are working out on the list of uh, inseminators that uh, we have, those who are working with our agents out there. We will be putting another webinar purely for, um, for inseminators. And what we're looking at inseminators, other than cattle registration, we shall also be training them on semen handling. Uh, those are some of the things that are coming up in our, in our calendar in this uh, series of webinars. So just keep locked in. Uh, we will be answering, uh, we will be handling that topic one of these fine days. Uh, somebody from OPPO A5S, uh, say is very nice and educative presentation. Thank you. We appreciate for your comments. Um, Helima is saying good presentation. Kindly let us know how you can work with uh, how you work with livestock recording center. I think that one has been answered. Ignatius Ngome, you said hi. Is the meeting CPD credited? Um, this one for today is not CPD credited, but uh, uh, check out in our website. We have several, several 
uh, engagements that are CPD credited. Just like the other day, we just had a field day in Nakuru uh, last week that was CPD credited. You could have joined and probably earned your CPD points. So kindly keep, keep it locked and uh, keep on following us through and you will get the CPD points that you so need. I think at this juncture, I will uh, welcome uh, Dr. Wambugo uh, just to give us a nutshell and a winding word, even as I come back to pray so that I will lose you. Thank you. Karibu sana, Dr. Thank you, Mary. Uh, uh, dear participants and Dr. Mwangi, I take this opportunity to thank you all for making time also for this webinar out of your busy schedule. Like you had Mary say, we, this is just uh, beginning. We will be having a series of webinars running. So keep checking on our social media platforms and we'll keep you posted. And uh, if you, there's a topic you do want uh, tackled, we, please uh, share with us and we'll be able to get the experts to look at it. One of them being that issue of feed formulation, you can be sure we've taken note. Continue engaging us and uh, watch out on, and um, the slides will be available on our Facebook page where you can uh, be able to access at your own convenience and at your own comfort. Thank you once again, back to Mary. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Tari. Thank you for every organization. A big up and thanks to Lilian Chebet, who's been our host, assistant host, and uh, also one of the organizers of the webinar. Now, as we wind up, let me just uh, say a word of prayer. Dear God in heaven, we come before you. We say thank you. Thank you for giving us this session. Thank you for the information we've got that today we will not be among your people who perish because of lack of knowledge, for we have added knowledge to what we have. May this knowledge be helpful to us in our businesses and in our farms. And after everything, may glory and honor be unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that, I think uh, we've come to the end uh, of our webinar. It's exactly 12.07. We intended to close at 12. So we've taken seven more of your minutes and we apologize for that. Otherwise, thank you very much. You can leave at your pleasure.